Hi, this is Kelsey Fukowski for AP Gov Review, and in Unit 5, we're going to be looking at public policy, and in particular, in our first installment, we'll be looking at economic policy making. So looking first at the policy making process, really the first thing is involved in policy, if you remember that chart from other videos, is recognizing the problem, really setting the agenda. People have to bring it to the government's attention, and that comes in the form of interest groups, court cases. Um, people also in government push their own agenda as well. Sometimes Congress persons may have their own particular issues. So that is important in getting them to become a priority. And then with number two uh, is dealing with formulating that policy. You need enough people within that government to act and come up with a plan of action. Typically, you're going to have several different potential solutions, and you're going to have to evaluate them, especially if they're done at the state level. The third step is eventually adopting that policy where it becomes official action and it can be in the form of a legislative, executive, or bureaucratic order or it can even come in the form of a court decision. So there are many steps that have to be passed through over time. It can be very complex as well to eventually adopt that policy. Remember if you're thinking about a bill becoming a law, remember how involved that's, uh, that process really is. Fourth part is the implementation of the policy. The government must see that policy is applied to real situation. So, for example, if there's new gun control laws, then the public needs to know about them. There must also be enforcement. And that's also where you're going to see the bureaucratic agencies as discussed in the subunit of Unit 4. So that is important as well. And then finally, you have to evaluate the policy. Has more good or harm been done over time with that policy? Inevitably, some will call for some changes and corrections, but again, it's a continuous process where you're going to need to be evaluating that policy, see if it's effective or not, especially if money is going to be uh, being spent on it. So two uh, competing economic views, since we're going to be looking at economic policy in this particular video. Really up until the turn of the 20th century, you had laissez-faire economics, the idea of hands-off right? That's free capitalism, very, very little government intervention, virtually no regulation. And if you're familiar with the Gilded Age, you'll recall that there was basically unrestrained, unrestricted capitalism. And where you begin to see that the tide turn, of course, is under Teddy Roosevelt and uh, Taft and then eventually Wilson. But really where it takes a major, major turn is under FDR's New Deal, where you see the government playing a much greater role in managing the economy. And really, this philosophy of economics is known as uh, Keynesian economics, which the idea is that the government should really be actively involved. And as a result, we've seen the growth of the government's hand within the economy. And again, for better or worse, depending on what side of the political ideology spectrum that you're on, but that has increased over the years uh, since, again, uh, starting with the New Deal. And that makes the United States very much a mixed economy as you have some capitalistic elements and you also have some social socialistic elements as well. Moving on to the economics, uh, budgeting is, of course, probably the most important decision-making process of the government. If you just look at the budgets over time, it is quite amazing. 1933, a $4 billion budget. Compare that to 2008 with a $2.7 trillion budget, which at that time made up of approximately 20% of the gross domestic product of the GDP. The national debt as of 2007 has been $9 trillion. Of course, that has gone up uh, more than doubled. And you have a deficit, which is the amount overspent in a given year, at about $162 billion. A really good example of, you know, or not really example, but a good predictor, rather, of next year's budget is going to be taking last year's budget and then just adding a little bit more because really the budget has increased, uh, for the most part, steadily over, over time. And if you look at the increase in total federal debt uh, by president, you've seen that really since George W. Bush and Obama, they have really significantly increased the total federal debt according to this chart. And again, you have fluctuating deficits. And again, this can be based on a number of different issues going on, uh, whether that being a cut in income tax under W. Bush or the war in Iraq beginning, or uh, as we saw here with the beginning of uh, President Obama's uh, presidency, with spending uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and of course the uh, Economic Recovery Act, this significantly increased the amount of spending. 
So the president's budget, of course, is going to be proposed. Congress requires the president to submit a budget to them. In the 1970s, Nixon actually reorganized the Bureau of Budget, and today it is known as the Office of Management and Budget. Sometimes you'll hear it as the OMB. And sort of the timeline as to how this happens. In the spring, you have the budget policy being developed. You have budget decisions that are going to be conveyed to agencies and assisting them in preparing their own budgets. By the fall, you have your estimates uh, for the coming fiscal year with projections. And then by the winter, you have the president's budget being determined and submitted. So you see that this really is in the process of, a, of approximately about a good year. So there's a good amount of time, effort, and energy that goes into this. Now, but the budget, it's a document that announces first how much the government will collect in taxes. And of course, these are estimates, how much the government will spend in revenues. And then lastly, how expenditures will be allocated amongst various programs and agencies. So that's really what the budget is going to do. Under the Congressional Budget Act of 1974, it lays out these procedures. I don't think you're going to really need to know these procedures uh, in depth, all seven particular steps, but just you know, as an FYI, should you get something on this subject matter? Again, it begins with the president submitting the budget. You have committees that are going to analyze the budget. You have resolutions that propose budget ceiling, meaning how high uh, the amount of spending that can go for a particular budget. Uh, members are informed whether or not spending proposals conform to budget resolutions. And then you have your committee process um, allowing them to proceed or not proceed. And then it sends it to the president for signature. Again, it is difficult to really enact a lot of big changes in government because a lot of government spending comes down to entitlements. For example, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, those are the big three. A lot of money is spent there. And then the big loophole is Congress is not required to tighten the government's financial belt. Unlike states, states have to pass a budget. Most states do have a particular law on the books that requires them to set a budget and not exceed that budget. With the federal government, they can go well beyond that because they have more means to tax. They have really no limits there. So that's been a major uh, loophole. Now, if you look at this graph here, the median income of a proximate family is $51,000 plus or minus a few thousand. Uh, and if they spent money like the federal government does, they would be spending about $60,000 a year, uh, which is well over their budget, which means $9,500 on the credit card every year. And despite that, already being $300,000 in debt. So this is a good parallel example to an, an American family uh, that, you know, American family very much has to somewhat live with inside its budget, but really the government doesn't. And that's been a major criticism that conservatives have put forward. Now, with policy, uh, dealing specifically with fiscal policy, this refers to um, affecting the economy by making changes in government's method of raising money through taxation and spending it. So major sources of income include federal income taxes, social insurance taxes, borrowing, and other miscellaneous taxes, which I'll get to on the next slide. And if you've ever... Uh, to, uh, receive the formal paycheck, you know, you're supposed to get, let's say, $500 a week, and then you look at your take-home pay and you're only getting $300 a week, you might be a little peeved. But remember, a lot of that money is going to insurance programs, it's going to the government to be spent. And as a result, I mean, that is a significant amount. Now, the 16th Amendment, which is going to be passed during the Progressive Era, is going to authorize Congress to enact it the income tax. Now, an income tax had been enacted earlier during the Civil War. However, you're going to see this during uh, really being permanent, and of course, it still exists today. So federal income taxes are the largest source of federal revenue, 45% it accounts for. And the United States has a progressive income tax, meaning that the more money that you have, it's the idea that you have a higher ability to pay, and thus you're going to pay a higher tax rate. So if you're making $100,000 a year, let's just hypothetically say you would be paying 40% of that to the U.S. government. Whereas if you're making $30,000, you might only pay 20% of that. So notice that you're not only paying more just in terms of the, the raw amount of, the, uh, of money, but you're also paying a higher percentage. 14% does come from corporate income tax, and most citizens don't understand the complex tax codes. Uh, there have been many, many calls for simplification, and if you actually understood it, you probably would file your own taxes, but probably your parents, including myself, we don't typically file taxes ourselves unless you trust TurboTax. Typically, you have an accountant because it's just there's just so many different procedures and different 
complex uh, regulations in the tax code that makes it very, very difficult. Other revenue taxes include social insurance taxes. You pay Social Security and Medicare taxes. These are two of the largest. And this is really a majoritarian tax in a way that it benefits uh, the major versus the interest group of a select few. So when you hit the age of 65, you will get your Social Security, you'll get your Medicare that you're paying into. Uh, employers apply these taxes even to their own employees. And you're going to, of course, receive these benefits when you get older, knock on wood, and account for about a third of the federal government revenue. So do know that social insurance taxes, that being Social Security and Medicare, are the top ones. Borrowing. Well, certainly uh, a lot of borrowing of money from taxpayers to fund expenses happens. Deficit spending has slowed in the 1990s during the economic boom. But after 9-11 and the wars, uh, this has occurred again. So that uh, is also an issue. Other taxes, which is a smaller percentage of income, include an excise tax. So, uh, for example, when you go to the gas station, probably, let's say, the, the price of a gas without tax is uh, $1.75. But at the pump, you pay $2 because that's an excise tax. Uh, you also pay for air travel. You know, it's tax on a number of things. There are also regressive taxes, and you see these at the state level where the tax is the same for everyone regardless of income. A good example of that is sales tax. Whether you're rich, you're poor, or middle class, we all pay the same amount of income tax. So that's a good example of a regressive tax. Estate taxes as well, levied on property, money inherited, that's really for the ultra-wealthy. Then you also have customs, duties, and tariffs, those are goods imported to the United States. So where the money goes? So the president submits the budget, seeks the approval of Congress. October is the official start. And the top three categories, you definitely know that the top one is entitlement programs. Again, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. National defense comes in number two. And then payment of the national debt is number three. So when we look at entitlement programs, you have your Social Security, unemployment insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, and you pay into these and you'll later receive these budget, uh, this money back. Also with the national defense, 23% of the budget, and this has steadily uh, increased during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then you have 8% of the money actually going to the national debt, paying that off in terms of interest. So when you look at this uh, with democracy and economic policies, uh, you have voters who expect more politicians than they can control. Liberals tend to favor more taxation, while conservatives are going to favor less taxation, less government involvement in the economy. That's important to know, uh, as discussed in Unit 2 with political behavior. So definitely be aware that liberals and conservatives have a major hand in shaping fiscal policy. That is very important as to should there be tax cuts, should there be tax increases. Again, that can come down to one's ideology. All right, so let's end here with a review question. If the government takes a bigger bite from the income of a rich family than from the income of a poor family, then the tax system is which of the following? Take a moment. And if you said choice A, progressive, you would indeed be correct.